Arctic marine living with Convention for the Conservation of
please, I would call the meeting in order. Would you please take your seats? Let me warmly welcome Deputy Minister uh, Johanna Sumuvori from the Foreign Ministry of Finland and State Secretary Terhi Lehtonen from the Ministry of the Environment, as well as uh, climate and environment activist uh, Helena Kvalinga to the formal opening of the 45th meeting of consultative parties of the Antarctic Treaty. And I would first give the floor to Deputy Minister Sumuori, you have the floor. Thank you. Dear friends, dear participants, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 45th consultative meeting of the Antarctic Treaty. This is the first time Finland has the honor of hosting the ATCM meeting of parties. It makes me especially happy that we can meet again here in person, and I warmly thank you all for making the effort to come to Helsinki despite quite a long journey for many of you. After the Council 2020 meeting and the experience of many virtual and hybrid meetings of the last few years, we probably all agree that nothing beats personal contact and familiar face-to-face -face conversation. Let us make the most of this opportunity and make the meeting a success. For some of you, this may be the first time visiting the Arctic. I would therefore like to start by, uh, by saying a few words about Finland as an Arctic country. We are currently in the early summer of the Northern Hemisphere, which is characterized by a mild climate and white nights. This time of the year, also the Arctic tern, known for its long yearly migration, arrives from Antarctica to nest on our Arctic shores. Winters in Finland, on the other hand, can be very harsh. Days are short and temperature can throw below minus 20 degrees. This has forced us Finns to cope with the cold climate and find sustainable solutions to secure living conditions and the functioning of society in extreme conditions. It is no co coincidence that Finland is one of the world's leading ice-breaking countries. Only a couple of hundred meters away from our meeting venue is the home port of our six largest ice-breakers. It's quite often said that we don't talk, talk much, we, we probably don't break the ice when, by speaking, but we can really break the real ice by our icebreakers. <laughs> the Finnish Arctic strategy classifies entire Finland as Arctic. Finland's Arctic interests and Arctic expertise uh, are relevant to the whole country, and on the other hand, the Arctic character of entire Finland enhances Finland's international image as the Arctic country. Uh, all activities in the Arctic region based on ecological carrying capacity, climate protection, principles of sustainable development and respect for the rights of indigenous peoples. The objectives arising from Finland's economic interest, interests uh, must be also examined from this perspective. Uh, the Arctic Council is a key component of Arctic governance and the preeminent forum for circumpolar Arctic cooperation. The Council's work on sustainable development, environmental protection, biodiversity con uh, conservation and climate change is of primary importance for us. We have cherished the idea of keeping the Arctic free of geopolitical tensions. Unfortunately, Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine has seriously impacted the Arctic cooperation. The Arctic Council has not been able to convene normal meetings or make decisions uh, since the spring of 2022, and many projects have been put on hold. The invasion has not only violated the principles of the United Nations Charter and the OSCE, it has also significantly hampered the traditionally flourishing Arctic cooperation. Looking back over a period of 10 years, significant changes have taken place in the international oper operating environment. 
Climate change has further accelerated these changes both in the Arctic and Antarctic environment. We see these changes happening around us, and even though they may seem slow, uh, they will inevitably affect the life on Earth and its inhabitants now and in the future. We have received enough scientific evidence to know that these changes are irreversible and call for urgent action. While the Arctic and the Antarctic are in many respects different, they also have a great many factors in common. Climate change and its impacts manifest most clearly and with stronger effects in the polar regions. However, the, the effects are not limited to these regions only. Sea level rise caused by melting polar ice is an example of changes that have global impact and can have particularly traumatic effects, especially on people living on coastal areas and islands. With good reason, we can celebrate the Antarctic Treaty as a great success of international treaty-based co treaty cooperation. Throughout the years, the treaty has provided a solid mechanism for governing the Antarctic. It has served well in its original function and even succeeded in developing new instruments when necessary, such as the environmental protocol. Above all, the treaty has proven its strength as an agreement of peace and cooperation. It ensures environmental protection for the entire continent and dedicates it to scientific research. It, in today's turbulent world, this remarkable achievement deserves full recognition. It is essential to continue to maintain the integrity of the Antarctic Treaty system and ensure that Antarctica remains a peaceful continent where international co cooperation can thrive. Just against this background, it is all the more regrettable and condemnable that one consultative party violates through violent hostilities the spirit of the treaty and prevents the other party from fully realizing its goals. Finland stands with full solidarity with Ukraine. The effects of rapidly advancing climate change, growing tourism and use of natural resources are examples of emerging challenges that we did not need to consider in the early years of the treaty in the 1960s. These challenges have increasingly come to our tables be it United Nations and international climate negotiations or more regional cooperation such as the Antarctic Treaty. At the same time, the scientific community produced us new and increasingly alarming information about the state of the Earth. Scientific evidence is unequivocal. Climate change is not a distant threat somewhere in the future, but it's already now endangering human well-being and the health of this planet. We must take urgent action now to combat climate change and its impact. I would like to express my thanks to the scientific community, which for decades have been producing valuable information for the protection of Antarctica. This work will be extremely important also in years to come. It is our generation's responsibility to find solutions based on the best available knowledge and ensure the sustainability of the planet for future generations as well. I am happy that the representative of the next generation, Helena Gualinga, is with us today. And as young climate activists, which are of which I have met many during this, this post as a state secretary, they say that they are not uh, the generations for the future, they are generations for the now, today. They are, they are living uh, today in the midst of these challenges and they, we need them to be part of finding these solutions for the planet. I am especially pleased that for the first time in the history of the Antarctic Treaty, the meeting in Helsinki dedicates an entire day to climate change. This is of course a continuation of long-term work with the AT system, which has produced a good foundation for further efforts. We the parties must now confirm our strong commitment to continue the work and make the right and wise decisions to protect Antarctica. We also have an important role in taking this message forward to other tables where climate issues are negotiated and decisions are made. Together, we can send a powerful message from Helsinki to our climate negotiators who will gather next week in Bonn at an UN climate conference to prepare for the next uh, 
uh, COP COP meeting in Dubai in December this year. Uh, dear participants, dear friends, uh, I would like to summarize our mission in the slogan of the Helsinki meeting from urgency to action. We know that there is urgency to combat climate change and its impacts. We also have the agency, capacity and power to do the right choices. Let's act accordingly. I would like to encourage everyone to be forward thinking and participate in the discussions in a constructive spirit. As the host country, Finland hopes that this spirit will prevail and inspire ATCM discussions during the next few weeks. I wish you all constructive and fruitful discussions and trust that you will make the right decisions. And uh, heartfully, fully thank you again for traveling to Helsinki. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Deputy Minister Somovuori, uh, for, for these uh, important messages uh, to this meeting. And I would now move on uh, with, uh, with um, our speakers list to, to uh, State Secretary Terhi Lehtonen. You have the floor, Madam. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paivi. Uh, dear participants, it's an honour and pleasure for me to join uh, Deputy Minister Somovuori in uh, welcoming you in Helsinki. As a consultative party, Finland supports the continuation of efficient and good functioning of the Antarctic Treaty System. The Madrid Protocol on Environmental Prote Protection provides a comprehensive framework for the preservation of the unique and fragile ecosystem of Antarctica. It is a success in the field of international environmental law. In addition, it plays an important role in maintaining the region as a zone of peace and constructive cooperation. We highly value the work of the Committee for Environmental Protection and its important role in promoting the protection of the Antarctic environment by reviewing, evaluating and reporting on the effectiveness of, me effectiveness of measures to protect the Antarctic environment. The topic of the joint session of the ATCM and the CEP this week is climate change, a much needed discussion also in this context. We are collectively not on track to reach the Paris Agreement commitments to hold the increase of global average temperatures to well below two degrees Celsius and to pursue limiting increase to one and a half degrees. For polar regions, including Antarctica, exceeding the one and a half degree level would lead to a loss of several cryospheric elements, including the Antarctic ice sheet and subsequent sea level rise. The elevated sea level levels would have dramatic consequences for societies and ecosystems in all coastal regions across the globe. Sea levels would remain elevated for thousands of years. I wanted to start by noting these facts put forward by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, Research or SCAR, to set the global context for the issues we are discussing when we consider the Antarctica and climate change. Only deep, rapid and sustained greenhouse gas emission reductions would limit the changes that our Antarctic is experiences, thus limiting the sea level rise. Greenhouse gas emission reductions need to take place immediately. We call on all parties to revisit their NDCs and to increase the ambition of their climate action to align with the Paris Agreement commitments. Both the ATCM and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, need to base their decisions on the most recent scientific information. Such information is compiled and conveyed by the IPCC and specifically in the Antarctic context by the SCAR. Therefore, Finland encourages constant cooperation and exchange of information between the UNFCCC and the ATCM, as well as between the scientific community, SCAR and IPCC. I would also like to say a few words about the significance and state of the exten extensive biodiversity in the polar regions. Polar seascapes and icecapes are home to vulnerable and fragile ecosystems and species. Polar landscapes store vast amounts of the world's freshwater resources as ice. As everyone around this table will know, 
the polar regions play a crucial ro role in regulating the world's climate. The white ice reflects some of the sun's rays back into space, helping to keep the Earth an, at an even temperature. Sea ice also helps to regulate the movements of warm and cold water around the oceans. The biodiversity in the polar region is vulnerable to disruption. Ecosystems across the entire polar regions are in an, an, uh, in an unprecedented stage of change due to rapid climate change, pollution and other stressors. Strong negative impacts are already observed on habitats and populations of species, as well as ecosystem functioning and services. The triple planetary crisis, climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution, is caused by activities elsewhere. But um, the impacts are felt manifold in the polar regions, which in turn have major global consequences. We can therefore not ignore the connection between the global work on sustainable development and the work on protecting Antarctic environment. The recent report of the UN Secretary General paints an alarming picture. Right now, the world is not on track to meet Agenda 2030 sustainable development goals. At the current pace, we would only meet 12% of the targets set, including economic, social and ecological aspects of sustainability. Meeting goals requires action. Finland has been rather successful at the strategic level in enhancing sustainable development. Right now, we need to focus more on concrete actions to achieve the goals. Enhancing sustainable development is a common effort. In Finland, we have worked together for sustainable development for, 20, uh, for 30 years now. Our National Commission on Sustainable Development, chaired by the Prime Minister, is a multi-stakeholder forum that combines key actors in society for joint action to implement the 2030 Agenda. Our National Strategy for Sustainable Development was prepared by this National Commission. Hence, the strategy is not only for the government, but for the whole society. Dear participants, I hope this meeting will send a strong message to the outside world, highlighting the multiple changes Antarctica is experiencing, a call for global action. I also hope it provides a space to discuss the consequences of climate and other environmental changes in the region for operations in Antarctica, including how to reduce the carbon footprint of such operations. And once more, thank you for coming to Helsinki. I truly hope you will enjoy your time here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, State Secretary uh, Terhi Lehtonen, for, for these words, uh, uh, reminding us of the urgency of the seriousness and also on the sustainability uh, uh, goals that we all uh, should bear in mind. And I would now uh, give floor to Helena Kualinga. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Helena Walinga, and I often talk about the protection of my home, which is in the Amazon rainforest, in the Ecuadorian Amazon rainforest, about my community who has fought off oil for decades and how we're now struggling to keep out other extractive industries and facing the climate crisis. I often talk about the living forest, which is the cosmovision of my people, and which is the fundamental part why we've struggled so much to protect our homelands. The living forest means that we recognize everything in the forest and in nature as a living being. And currently we're also pushing for those to be recognized legally within our own country. What I do not often talk about is that I have another homeland, which is Finland, the home of my father, the, the country of a thousand seas and a thousand lakes, the country where beautiful old growth forest exists and also home to indigenous people, the Sami people. My father is a scientist and as a, when he was younger, he was also an activist and he taught me about the importance of protecting these lands of the importance of protecting the forest and nature in this country too, an Arctic country. And even though these worlds seem incredibly different and both culturally, socially, politically, economically, 
I believe that these sacred ecosystems are deeply interconnected. What is happening in the poles, unfortunately, does not stay in the poles. Because as the poles are melting, we can see that my other home country is being flooded by tremendous floods every year now. Just three years ago, my entire community was flooded and 80% of it was destroyed. We've still not been able to build up properly, but we are trying to. My family members lost their homes. We lost our crops. And this was also happening during the pandemic, so you can imagine what the impacts were on our community. I do my work because I believe that we can find a better but similar world to the one that I grew up in. Because I still have vivid memories of running around both in the Finnish forest as I have running around in the Amazon rainforest. I want future generations to be able to live and see and experience that exactly the way that I did. The joy that it brought me, the safety that, that it brought me, the teachings that it brought me. I often say that there is no room for fear in the work that I do. I have realized that with fear, I cannot move. But if I find joy and if I find something beautiful, I do. I can move, I feel inspired, and I can continue this work. And there are a few words that scare me, but there is one in particular that I actually find very fearful. And it's when I hear the word irreversible damage. Because that means that future generations will not be able to experience those things that I could experience. It means that future generations will not be able to see the world the way that you did, or even I did. They will not be able to see snow. They will not be able to see clean forests and rivers and see what our connection to nature is that we actually are not something that is opposite to nature, but that we humans also belong into nature. It might feel isolating to sit here in a room filled with walls and concrete and lights, but we actually do belong out there. And be, I say this because I've lived half of my year out in the rainforest. We still have traditional huts. We still live by fishing and hunting and growing our food in the forest. Our houses are made out of traditional huts. And when I am there, it feels like I am outside because I hear all the sounds of the rainforest at the same time. But when we talk about irreversible damage, we're talking about these ecosystems falling apart, about these ecosystems not being able to function at one point. Many times people look to young people and look for hope because young people have risen, because young people have said that enough is enough, because young people want to be engaged and want to participate, and we do have a say in the decisions that are being made. But we also are looked at as the generation that will solve this crisis. Yet I am the only young person in this room. And that leaves you to be the decision makers. That means that we will inherit a world and a legacy of your efforts and your ambitions. It means that it does still lay in your hands. So I, speaking of for my generation, say that we count on you to stand on our side and make the ambitions, to have the ambitions, and to do leave us the legacy that we deserve and need for our survival. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Helena Gualinga, for these uh, touching words, the, the message from the, uh, the youth to this, uh, this meeting. And um, I, I think we have heard very uh, important messages from all of the three speakers. Um, I'm aware of their, um, their pressing time schedule, so I would uh, intend to walk them out from the room, uh, allow them to move on with their, their other commitments. I have uh, recognized that Russia has requested the floor, and I will give the floor once I return to the room.